This is the Page Publishing Book Club. How you doing? I'm Alice Stockton Rossini. Hey, Mad Men fans. Love those 50s suits and dresses, right? The big cars, Don Draper. When smoke-filled offices became dens of creativity and destruction. Well, Richard Burns was one of those guys. An ad man. And then he died over 30 years ago. You heard right. He died. Check out the rest of the story in Live or Die, Act 2. I had a fertile hemorrhage. Hemorrhagic stroke. My brain was destroyed. I couldn't walk or talk for five years. An operation. They turned an eye around because I had a detached retina and it triggered something in the head. And you were like a vegetable for five years? Yeah, well, maybe four. I'm not sure. I bounced off walls. Couldn't talk. Uh, Hey, I'm fine. I'm now 90 years old. How were you able to get through that? Guts. And not giving up. And being realistic. And working at things that made me better and help people. Do you remember waking up, regaining consciousness? They just covered me with a sheet. Next morning, the sheet and put rolled me out back. Next morning, the sheet moved. As in the morgue? Dead. Dead. The sheet moved. Scared the hell out of them. I was in three hospitals initially, and many more over the years for various and sundry problems, bleeding ulcers, not being able to function, physical problems. You underwent, I guess, extensive physical therapy, right? No. Physical therapy, I did myself. I just looked after after seeing two. I was the national spokesperson for for national stroke, and I figured that what worked for stroke could work for people with any kind of uh, terminal illness, and that's why I started going around the country to hospitals and doctors and survivors and giving them hope and showing them how to do it. How do you do it? I mean, is it your state of mind? Partially. And you just, you have to find out what's wrong, and you take one thing at a time, and and you do it over and over and over. Some things with me took years. Uh, I couldn't hold a glass of liquid in my left hand for 10 years. I couldn't eat for 25. Liver Die Act 2 is a, a treatise on how to cope with a serious illness, a deadly illness, and how to come out of it alive. And I helped a lot of people. And I decided that I would write it because people need to know that they can do this. Doctors need to know that they can do this. I don't care whether it's a heart attack or uh, Alzheimer's or cancer or stroke. This tells you what to do and how to do it. The book does. Let's say you can't walk, you can't get out of bed. You force yourself to get out of bed, and after maybe uh, six months to maybe a year, maybe just a gestation period of nine months, and you walk and you make your legs move, and pretty soon it works. The muscles adapt. Your body adapts. Uh, In 2000, a group of doctors met in La Jolla, California for cancer patients. They found something they called the rostral migratory stream, which is in the back of the head. It's filled with hormones and stem cells, which race around the body, become body cells, and then become part cells. And that's what you stimulate when you force yourself to do something. You take The secret is you take one thing at a time and you do it over and over and over. It may take you months. It may take you years. But you know something? It works. This book talks about all kinds of illnesses and what to do with them. I thought it was important to put it down so people could live and not die. Yeah, it would be nice. That's why the title, Live or Die. I became a consultant, went around the country, George's May Company. They were the biggest consulting firm in the world at the time. After I did things with with the, the various problems that you face can be handled by turning your body to work to make things work. And it works.
if you forgive the pun, whatever redundancy. Uh, 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 we can do book signings and shelf space and display, and the word's going to get around. And uh, I have a social media campaign going with a Facebook page and YouTube and this kind of stuff. It's going to take a little time. This is not something that's done overnight. I only have one one thing in mind, and it's not making money. I've got enough, and I'm too old anyhow. The jo- the idea, very simply, is to make it work for people who have given up hope. I'll give them that hope, and that's what the book does. That's a wonderful gift, Richard. Thank you. What a story. Okay, so what happens when you do die? Well, Janie McCorkle, a retired preschool teacher, is helping people all over the world with her metaphysical gifts, and that includes her book entitled Transition, There Is No Death. What inspired me was back in 2004, August 16th, 2004, and I had a two-hour experience with the light, also known as the Holy Trinity, three entities, and it lit up the whole room. And the next day, I have 23 metaphysical experiences in one month. And I've been gifted since five years old, and I'm 69 right now, and they're still happening. And also, my brother passed away, my younger brother, and it was time that I tell people, let them know that there is no death. It's just a transition. It's not as bad as people think. We go on. Our spirit goes on. And I had to let people know of my experiences. Let me tell you my latest one. I had a call from Thailand from an archaeologist friend of mine. He says, Janie, can you help this man? His son is missing in Cancun, Mexico. And they found his bag, his passport, um, money, everything, his keys on the beach. And some people say he drowned, but could you help? I said, let me try. Well, that evening, I was just lying on my bed uh, watching TV. And when I closed my eyes, I was in Cancun, Mexico. I was in a dark, what I thought was a cave. And I saw three men dressed in army jackets. And I spoke to the man telepathically And I said, are you being watched? And he looked at me and he nodded his head. I said, okay, is um, Rick there? This was the man's son's name. And he nodded his head, yes. I said, okay, I'm here to help. I'll be back. I opened my eyes and I'm back in my, my bedroom. And the next day it happened again. And I was in a car in Cancun, Mexico. And I saw the beautiful white sandy beaches and the car stopped. And I floated out. This is my spirit doing it. And all of a sudden, the sand started descending. And I thought, oh, my God, this is a cartel tunnel. Well, I thought, oh, my God, the man's son, and he's 45 years old, by the way. He's not some young boy. And he was in Afghanistan and the military. And I emailed uh, this man's father. And I said, he's with the cartel. A week later... I get a phone call from him. He says, oh, my God, Janie, you're so right. A family friend was in Cancun, Mexico, and they saw my son in a bar with the cartel. What my body does is I can bi-locate. I can be in two places at once. Humans don't do this until they pass over, but I'm doing it now. This is one of the gifts from the Holy Trinity. I'm doing all sorts of things. I also astro project which is my full spirit leaves my body and then it comes back. Um, I also predicted this pandemic we're having now back in 1979. And then I predicted it again in 2016. And I also see the future when I go to sleep at night, I just close my eyes and it's like a flat screen, like I'm watching TV and I see the future. Um, I, I just do these things and I'm still progressing today. So I I have many experiences um, that I share with people, and I want them to know there's nothing to fear. This this is just the earth school we're in to learn. Uh, We will be judged just on the way we treat people. has nothing to do 
with um, how wealthy we are or educated. It has to do the way we treat each other. Earth School. I like that, Janie. Thank you. Arlene Rogers Wilhite recently retired as a drug and alcohol counselor, and she's starting a new life. It includes writing a book about her life entitled Sidewalk Talks, a compilation of 17 short stories of the best years of my life. Basically, it was the childhood sexual abuse that I went through. And I wanted to like tell my story about how it came about in my in my life. And I wanted to do it in a way where it just wouldn't be centered on the childhood sexual abuse. And so I uh, came up with the idea of the 17 short stories and kind of just threw that in the in the middle, so to speak. The main story is about the guy that that I met uh, while I was going through my abuse, I came up pregnant and I met this gentleman named uh, Roussel and he sort of just, you know, t- helped me to get up out of that turbulence in my life. And that's uh, the main story that's, that's centered around all the other uh, sexual abuse. So his story is in the book and it's called Roussel. And it talks about um, how I had a crush on him as a as a young girl, and I didn't know that he was going to end up being my uh, ram in the bush because when I came up pregnant, I didn't want to tell uh, everybody who abused me. So I asked him. I said, "You know, could you uh, be my baby's daddy?" And he was like, "Whoa, you know," but he ended up saying yes. And then our relationship kind of developed and then ended as quickly as it developed after that, because he was much older than than I was. And something inside of me just told me, you know, I couldn't live with this man like that. I didn't realize all the ramifications that would come from him being older than I was. And so we kind of split up. And that's the premise of my whole idea of writing a book. So you have a you have a child. Yes, he's 48 now. <laughs> it's okay. Did everything turn out all right for him? Well, yes, because um, as I went through life, um, you know, trying to hide everything and uh, everybody thinking that, you know, Roussel, because Roussel is a Creole and uh, my son came out chocolate as I am <laughs> and Roussel had green eyes and pretty hair. My son came out with long hair, but it was coarse as ever. So I think people knew that that wasn't his, but nobody really questioned it. And I kind of touched, touched bases on that. But uh, I did get a chance after 40 something years, I did get a chance to talk to Roussel's family. And uh, he died last year on my birth, uh, two days after my birthday. So he he seen the baby and he talked to him after that, but you know we never had uh, we lost contact and I looked for him forever, you know, just to tell him thank you for putting his life on the line like that. And I just wanted people to know that you know he was a hell of a guy, you know. So I got a chance to talk to his daughter and and we we talk now and she said the same thing. She said, "Wow, that's that's really something." I'm glad you told me that story. So I thought she was gonna be really pissed off and mad and stuff but she wasn't at all she handled it all really good and I let her read the story and she was like really amazed by it the book I wrote the book back in 2009 and I went through drugs and uh, addiction and all like that and I kind of put it back on the shelf and as I started getting my life together and um one day you know the spirit, I believe there was a spirit just told me, look, you need to get this book out there because, you know, people need to read this, not only because of it being a true story, but it's still happening to young girls, you know, and in a different way. But and I wanted to, like I said, uh, I wanted to find an angle. And um, that's how one day I was just walking down the street and I stumped my toe and I and I got the inspiration right there. And I sat down. I said, you know what? I'm going to finish this book. And I did. And um, I ran across some advertisements and I saw Page Publishing. And I took that as a sign because um, 
you know, that's how I got started. And we're glad you did, Arlene. Thank you so much. We're going to take a short break, but we're coming right back. This is the Page Publishing Book Club. Have you written a book and want to get it published? Then now's the time to call Page Publishing at 800-204-6099 and do it immediately. You see, they're looking for authors of all types of books. And unlike most publishers, Page Publishing will take the time to review most of the books submitted to them. And they'll even give you their feedback. And if they like what they read, Page Publishing will get your book into bookstores and for sale online at Amazon, the Apple iTunes Store, and other outlets. They'll handle everything. Copyright protection, printing, cover art, publicity, and editing. So if you've written a novel, a children's book, a cookbook, inspirational work, a book of poetry, or biography, and want to get it published, then you need to call Page Publishing and do it immediately. Call 800-204-6099 now for your free author submission kit. Your road to fame and fortune could very well start with this simple phone call. For your free author submission kit, call Page Publishing at 800-204-6099. We're back on the Page Publishing Book Club. I'm Alice Stockton Rossini. You make choices, you suffer the consequences, or you reap the benefits. But when it comes to love, sometimes it's not clear which way it's going to go, right? Terrence Ramon Gills takes us down the road to romance in his book entitled Choice. Honestly, I wrote Choice when I was in the Navy. I started that 18 years ago. Because I I didn't consider myself a writer, so I I would put it off and put it off and put it off. And then finally, one day, I just started writing. And the next thing I knew, I had 250 pages. It was like a premonition. Uh, It was like I dreamed about this entire novel, all of my my characters, from the front page to the back. I I could see every word in my head. And choices is is about uh, uh, individuals and the choices they make. A lot of us make choices out of emotion instead of sitting down and really thinking about the choices that we make in our lives. And that gets a lot of us uh, in a lot of trouble. We make choices on emotion instead of logic. So Choice is a novel about a young man named Trevor. You know, he, was, he was born and raised by great parents. He was a very productive, very educated adult. But things happened in his life that he couldn't control, and he made a choice to go down another path that he wasn't ready for. It's erotic, so I want to put that out there. I want to make sure that people understand it's an erotic romance novel. And I, and I wrote it like that to capture your attention. I wanted it to be funny. I didn't want it to be dry, but I also want you to see the underlying message. It was a young lady in his life that he adored very much, uh, and she moved away, and he lost contact with her for several, several years. And when he reconnected with her, uh, her life choices had taken her to another path in life that she wasn't familiar with. And she hated herself for it. She chose the life of a porn star. And Trevor was willing to overlook all of that because of his love for for her. He didn't care about her being a porn star. It was sort of forced upon because of the way her mother interacted in life and the choices that she made and the things that happened to Crystal when she was younger. And how many people do you know Uh, that get involved in particular type of relationships, knowing that they are not the best choices for them, but they do it anyway. How many young ladies, how many men do you know do this on a day-to-day basis? I know several. I wrote it it very vivid. Uh, I gave it a lot of description because I wanted my readers to feel like they were there in the moment. I want them to feel the sun on their face. I want them to to smell the pine trees, the smell of the pine. I want them to feel the wind. So uh, there's a lot of detail into this novel. Writing this was a good experience for me. I mean, I've learned a lot. Paige, uh, they did a great job for me. I I can't say enough uh, about them. I'm very impressed with with what they did, how they put it together. It's been a a great ride. I mean, just writing the novel itself, as far as getting it edited, uh, how to 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 build that plot, keep that plot going, uh, for for readers to stay interested in what you're what you're reading or what they're reading rather. Uh, so yes, yes, it's a very good experience. Uh, I have it all over social media. Uh, I had cards um, like business cards printed out uh, that I hand out often uh, to people, and and I just walk up to people and I just ask them honestly. I just you know my. My, I think my, my crowd is going to be uh, females because it's, it's romance. 
you know, I'm not not counting out any guys because I know there are guys out there that do rate that do read romance novels, but I believe the majority of my audience is going to be females. So uh, I talk I talk to everyone, but the majority of my my audience, like I said, I, I speak to a lot of females uh, that I meet in the hospital um, when I'm out to eat, you know, in the grocery store, anywhere. I I ask them if they re- like to read novels, and if they do. I ask them what genre they like to read, and if they say romance, which most of them do, I, uh, I I give them one of my business cards. All right, Terrence, you are one motivated guy. I'll give you that. Thank you. Coming of age stories captivated Robert Murray when he was a teenager and inspired him to write. Now he imagines what happens in Camelot after the death of King Arthur in his book, The Aftermath of the King, Volume 1 series, Camelot Chronicles. Right, or at least after the death of Arthur. And uh, it was more of an intuitive reaction installing Guinevere. I mean, if I had thought about it too much, I might have thought there's no way an audience, audience is going to believe a disgraced woman could come back into power and lead the kingdom. But that's exactly what happens in the tale. And she just has the personal power to do that. Uh, to assume that she's gone through some regenerative process in the nunnery while Arthur's been battling Mordred. And now she's the only person with the experience to take over the kingdom. Robert, I love that. As a woman, I think you're on the right track, completely. Thank you. What has captivated you about Camelot? Uh, I've always been in the Camelot. Uh, I think uh, utopia is a rare thing to find in literature or art. It's so much more often the opposite. It's so much easier to write about the ugly side of humanity. But like a vision of uh, people living justly, uh, to borrow a phrase from uh, Justinian's Institutes, justice is the constant and perpetual will to secure to everyone their own right. And that's not something that you see in art very often. I think it's in Star Trek and Camelot, and that's really the only two examples that I know of. Everything else is the ugly side of humanity. It's about government taking control over us and imposing on us all these horrible laws. So this is a nice escape for you and for the reader. I hope so. So it says Volume 1, Series, Camelot Chronicles. So how many volumes do we have? Volume 2 will be out early in 2022, The Lion of Camelot. Um, I'm working on the third one. I'm midway through it. I think I can make it a yearly serial and put one out a year. I think Camelot has an eternal following. I think it's something that people will always be interested in. Oh, yeah, I think you're right about that. So no plans for, for any kind of promotion right now? Uh, I'm wor- what I'm really worried about, though, is becoming a salesman and losing the creative edge that I'm on. Like, I really have a tiger by the tail, and I don't want to let it go. And I'm worried that if I worry too much about money and exposure, I could fall off artistically. Yeah, but you want people to read your book, right? So you got to let them know about it. Now, maybe down the road, some book signings, an author talk at a library, maybe? Yeah, those are all things I'm sure I'll do at some point, but I realize that I'm not going to be an overnight success story. I know I'm going to have to put 30 to 40 years into the publishing industry to really get to where I want to be. And to, and I mean, I'm going to have to generate a lot of material over that period. Well, for sure it takes time, Robert. Keep it up. Inspired by fan fiction in middle school, Justin Seiler decided to try his hand at the genre with his book, Age of the Zodiacs. It's about children of the gods trying to survive a world filled with demons, dragons, and heartless people and create a free world for humans, vampires, and half-blooded demons. It was inspired by dark fantasy itself because I love the genre. Whether it be in TV shows, books, video games, anime, what have you. And the core concept itself was inspired by the Zodiac signs ourselves. Because it was just absently talking about it. Who has what Zodiac sign in class and all that. The story is about the children of the gods in a world in a mess. It's a world of fantasy, advanced technologies, fighting, civil war, betrayal, death. The main characters themselves, actually, in different parts of the world. Like, the story starts off with Opal, who's just now discovering her own gifts, as she is the child of Ares. Her village is destroyed, and she goes out trying to get stronger so she can survive. Because she found out that the king of the region she's in is the person who destroyed her entire village because he knew that she was a Zodiac child and wanted to kill her. What makes you a Zodiac child? 
You're a zodiac child when you're born with a zodiac constellation somewhere on your body, letting the entire world know that you're born from the power of that being. Like Opal is a child of Aries, as the Aries zodiac is on her arm, while another character like Cage, son of the Leo zodiac, and that zodiac sign is on his right shoulder. What happens is a zodiac's power is different from any other magical power on the planet. Sure, they can revolve around fire or ice or whatnot, but their level of magical power and potential is vastly different from a normal person's, which is why people fear them. A war right now is between the kingdoms themselves and the people, as the high-class nobles and people of the world constantly abuse their positions of power and wealth to harm the townsfolk, people not as noble as each other, or the other races of the world, such as the yokai, who are basically human monster hybrids, or people who are half demon or half dragon and such as they are seen as less than, seen as not really people and are constantly scorned against. The main focus does involve the war between high class and low class, poor and royal, but it also revolves around the main characters themselves and how they fit into each part of this world. Opal is against the king and nobility, while another zodiac a girl named Toa is for the king as she's a member of the army and fights on the king's orders. So it's not just black and white sides. It's about people and what they do and the choices they make and how those choices act or counteract each other. All right, Justin, looking forward to book two. Wow, we've had a lot of talk about choices on this show. How about that? Thanks for uh, choosing us for your midnight listening pleasure. And uh, for those of you downloading the podcast at 710WOR.com, not a bad choice either. I I, I have to apologize. I have some kind of summer cold, but um, I don't know. What do you think about this deep voice? It's nice to have a deep voice. What do you think? It'll be gone next week. Anyway, hope you're enjoying the end of the summer and maybe you'll choose to start writing and we'll see you here on the next edition of the Page Publishing Book Club. What do you say? I'm Alice Stockton Rossini. I'll catch you next time.